money supply started to go back up again after the process of rate hikes and the reduction of a uh, small reduction of the balance sheet of some of the central banks um, and started to go back up again because of the recovery in equity markets and the weakening of the US dollar. That situation has reverted. So the global money supply picture is actually one of stabilization. It looks like the world wants to accept this current rate hike path and this current normalization policy as one that is very accommodative. But at the same time, it is very evident that in any correction of markets, the dollar comes back and comes back strongly because the monetary imbalances of those countries that don't have the US dollar as their currency have actually spread and increased in the last two and a half years, particularly in the last three years. So emerging markets with twin deficits, large borrowings in US dollars added to the uh, improvement in the economy that is much weaker than what was initially expected. All of those things make the picture for the global monetary debasement much uh, of a, a much bigger problem than what we were uh, initially in expecting. If we think about it, the US dollar remains the world reserve currency, not because the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve is hawkish, but because the monetary and fiscal policy of the competing currencies uh, and their countries and their central banks is much worse. This is not a game of who wins, it's a game of who loses. And in the world of King Dollar, everybody else is losing. The impact of monetary policy on commodities is phenomenal. Quantitative easing in the first phase made commodities soar all over the world. Why? Much a very significant increase in the quantity of money and rate cuts made global commodities soar while the US dollar was weakening. Um, we can talk endlessly about supply and demand, and we certainly can talk endlessly about the geopolitical challenges. But right now, the most important factor impacting commodities is certainly monetary policy. Rate hikes are making storage, long positions, margin calls much more expensive. Therefore, commodities are falling in an environment in which the supply-demand picture is actually bullish because supply is constrained and demand is growing thanks to the China reopening, and in an environment in which most commodities are in uh, with inventories at the five-year or below the five-year average. Therefore, what we have to think about when we look at taking positions in commodities is when will the rate hike path be fully adjusted and fully discounted in markets? When will central banks stop the normalization, or at least when will the normalization uh, considered to be completed? And then is when we can think about the impact of the long-term picture, both in supply and demand, and the robust levels of strength in some of the commodities. Certainly, energy commodities are suffering from massive decrease in investment coming from years of underinvestment in uh, natural gas, in oil, but also in coal. Therefore, years of underinvestment, a supply demand picture that remains bullish added to uh, an inventory picture that is still solid may create another leg up of uh, commodities, particularly energy commodities, when the monetary policy uh, is fully discounted in the mind and in the, in the portfolios of most investors. 
in the years of very low rates and high liquidity injections, one of the main negative side effects of loose monetary policy was the rise in zombie companies. Zombie companies are those that are unable to repay their financial commitments with operating expenses. Zombie companies are a problem because they generate significant negative impacts on the economy. To start with, obviously, the misalignment of capital and misallocation of capital, which is in itself one of the big problems of loose monetary policy, is that you cannot basically avoid the reality of malinvestment. The second is the challenge that these uh, companies create to the financial system. They stress the financial system in a way in which was probably higher than what the uh, ratios would indicate because they tend to be very large companies. Second, uh, in, that, in that same category, what we have to understand is that the impact of uh, stressing the financial uh, sector by taking more credit crowds out credit for better companies with higher productivity and with better, uh, with better prospects of creating employment. And the third point is employment, is that if anything, what we can take from the recovery is that the rise of zombie companies generates what would be indicated as a jobless recovery, i.e. a recovery in which unemployment improves but labor participation ratio doesn't uh, come back to the levels prior to the crisis, the employment to population ratio remains low, the w number of working hours is below the periods prior to the crisis. So, Big problems arise from the rise of zombie companies. It is not a small problem, and it's certainly one that creates a, a, a much larger impact on the economy than what uh, central banks perceive. And the main reason is because most of what we deem as zombie companies tend to be uh, companies with high capitalization, companies that are large, so-called uh, national champions, even uh, very so-called strategic sectors. Careful with that word, strategic. A lot of investors have increased their exposure to European bonds under the idea that inflation was going to come down very quickly and that the yield of sovereign bonds in Europe started to be very attractive. However, the latest inflation figures show that not just inflation, headline inflation is persistent, but core inflation remains very elevated and rising. Therefore, the bet on sovereign bonds remains extremely risky. You're betting basically on governments that are not reducing their imbalances and at the same time that are paying a, a coupon, a yield, that is way below the level of inflation. So if uh, inflation takes longer to be curbed and the European Central Bank drags its feet and uh, stops its rate hikes in the middle of the year, then what we are likely to see is that the demand for these bonds will start to move to other safer assets with a better return. Right now, the risk return ratio of sovereign bonds, particularly European bonds, looks very unappealing to me. The difference of unemployment in the European Union relative to the United States is staggering because the European Union is supposed to be uh, an area that protects employment in a better way. However, the reality is that the difference of unemployment rate between the United States and the European Union has not just not uh, reduced but continues to be extremely elevated. If we look at the unemployment rate in the European Union, we, don't, we have to look not just 
at the official unemployment rate, but also at the shadow unemployment rate, i.e. those people that remain in furlough jobs, that remain in uh, different uh, schemes that pay for unemployment. And uh, the, uh, the level of unemployment, the shadow unemployment, according to UBS, is uh, even up to two points higher, two percentage points higher in the European Union than the official figure. That is a problem. That is a problem because uh, that is not being absorbed into the market and it's creating a uh, subclass that generates a, 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 a worsening of the productivity and that uh, are unable to come back to decent paying jobs and to improved uh, economic environments and they sort of get left behind from every crisis. So when we hear that the European Union protects employment better than the United States, sometimes when you protect too much, what you end up doing is simply generating persistent unemployment. The Chinese reopening is certainly helping the global economy to reach a better level of improvement in economic growth than was expected in October 2022. However, there are a number of caveats. To start with, real trade growth globally is weakening very fast. And actually, the data of real trade growth in October, November, and December is negative, bringing the real trade growth figure for the end of 2022 to the levels of the beginning of 2021. That weakening of real trade growth shows that countries are importing less, certainly, and that there is a lot less activity within the economies that used to be the engine of growth of the world. China is going uh, from a model of high and very intensive expenditure in uh, investment and in construction and net exports to a consumption-led model, which means that it's going to be a lot less import heavy and certainly one that is going to generate less of a multiplier effect on the global economy. So the improvement of the Chinese economy is not necessarily going to create the level of ripple effects and the level of positive impact on the rest of the world that many thought at the beginning of January 2023. It is very easy for a country's currency to lose its reserve status. Uh, one thing that we tend to hear is that as long as governments uh, support a currency, everything is fine. That is not true. A currency is only uh, worth what the people want to accept from it, i.e. the demand of the currency. And the demand can collapse even if the state imposes its utilization. Um, the reason why so many currencies are collapsing relative to the US dollar is precisely that. Governments forget that uh, the currency has to be a reserve of value, a unit of measure, and a means of payment of generalized use. And what they do is print like there's no tomorrow, thinking that nothing is going to happen. And what they create is the inflationary tax and ultimately the collapse of the demand of the currency. The MMT fallacy uh, comes to the fore yet again. It is not true that any government can issue all the currency that it needs without, uh, without a, a problem. It is actually the opposite. Governments tend to lose their currency and the reserve status very quickly when they forget that uh, the demand for the currency is as important as the supply. Actually, it is a lot more important. 